last few, I guess last couple weeks, the focus has been subject of repentance in relation to evangelism. And so this week, uh, on lesson number five, we'll be looking at God's law and evangelism. God's law and how it relates to evangelism. And uh, let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. God's law and evangelism. Very important subject in relation to evangelism. And Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And uh, so it is, uh, number one on your outline, it is the law that God uses to bring conviction to men's hearts. It is the law that God uses to bring conviction to men's hearts. There's no other way to get conviction. I mean, if you... Without the law, you don't have the knowledge of sin. Without the knowledge of sin, you're not going to have a realization that I've done anything wrong. And uh, so that's why God's law is a vital part, integral part of uh, evangelism and, and giving the gospel, that people have a knowledge of the law. And, uh, and now every person has in some way the law written on their heart in the terms of conscience. Everyone has, has conscience uh, that even... You know, even a child who hasn't been told that a particular thing should not be done, uh, they have this recognition, you know, you know why, why, why do children try to be sneaky? Because you know, they have this recognition, you know, this shouldn't be done. Even if they've never been told it shouldn't be done before. Just there's certain things, they just have, maybe their conscience uh, tells them that. And adults can be the same way. You know, why do adults uh, try to do things under cover of darkness or without people knowing well, because of conscience sake, you know, I, that there's a recognition that there is right and wrong. Now, there are people, and many people in the world today, that are trying to purposely push aside that principle, that truth of right and wrong, black and white, that uh, there is absolute truth, absolute right and wrong. But uh, you just can't get away from it. People can't, you can't get away from it. That's why when people try to do that, you can just tell they have such a twisted mind because it's a deviation from what is normal. And uh, so God's law is what God uses to bring conviction in men's hearts. And notice verse 19 again. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And uh, so the, uh, it says all the world. It says that every mouth may be stopped. There's no person that can be justified in God's sight by the deeds of the law because no one has perfectly kept the law besides you know, God in His perfection, Jesus Christ in the flesh. And so there's, uh, but the verse 20 at the end, I'll just say this as a side note. It says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And uh, that is one reason I believe that uh, children who are not of the age and not of the maturity of mind where they can understand the law of God or understand an offense against God are safe in that they're not necessarily saved, so to speak, in the same way like uh, a person when they trust Christ, but they're safe as, uh, in, in the sense of they're not going to, God's not going to send a child to hell who can't understand the uh, law of God and can't understand an offense against God. Now, children can... Uh, understand at a very early age disobey, disobeying their parents, but it takes some more time for them to grasp who God is and their offense, uh, the offense against God. So just because they can understand disobeying their parents so they know whether or not, whether or not they've disobeyed their parents, it doesn't mean they have had a recognition that they are sinning against God. And that's why it's so important because we don't know necessarily for each child what point in time they can understand that. That's why it's so important for uh, parents to, from a, just a very early age, even before the child can really be accountable to God for their sin, uh, 
that uh, we teach them about God, who God is, and teach them about the law of God, and teach them about Jesus Christ, because then when they can understand that, uh, then and, and God's law brings conviction. Spirit of God uses God's law. So when they are at that point where they can understand and grasp those things, and, and the Spirit of God brings conviction, they will have had understanding of God's law. They'll have at least a grasp of God's law and who God is, so that then they can respond uh, to the gospel. And, uh, but the same thing for an adult as well, uh, in the sense of an adult needs to have a grasp. I've sinned against God, needs to have the realization, needs to have that conviction. And it's God's law that does that. And, uh, you know, once it's, it's very basic. This is very elementary, but we'll keep it simple today. Uh, this, this simple point that a person can't trust in Christ as Savior unless they first are convinced they need a Savior. And uh, that's, I mean, that just uh, is, is as basic as it comes. But the, how do they become convinced they need a Savior? By the knowledge, the law is the knowledge of sin. And uh, so, so that is what God uses to bring conviction to men's hearts. And uh, number two is uh, most soul winning programs pass over the fact of sin and man's lost condition far too lightly and quickly. Most soul winning programs pass over the fact of, of sin and man's lost condition far too lightly and quickly. Turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51 and verse 5. Now, Psalm 51 is this psalm where David is confessing his sin to God. He's asking God for mercy, uh, for forgiveness, and uh, after he had committed adultery. And uh, Psalm 51, verse 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And then Isaiah 64, 6 uh, speaks, that we don't have to turn there necessarily, but I'll turn there and I'll read it, but if you don't get there, that's fine. Isaiah 64, 6 says, uh, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So there, give you an example here of how, uh, how oftentimes soul winners will pass over the fact of sin and man's lost condition far too lightly and quickly is that uh, this in, in, the, in our book here from David Cloud called Sowing and Reaping, which these lessons are based upon, uh, there was, he had a pastor friend who told him about an experience he had at a prominent independent Baptist church that operates a large Bible college. And so this is, this is an account from a different pastor. He says, we went out with their staff on Saturday morning for soul winning. We were immediately partnered up with some of the veterans. The first door we went to, we spoke to a friendly Catholic guy. And to my surprise, the guy got saved before my very eyes as this particular person took him from a few scripture passages to the sinner's prayer so smoothly that I was caught off guard. I caught myself and while the person was recording this man's contact details and writing it down, I asked the man whether, number one, he believed that he was a good person, and number two, that it is possible to go to heaven by being a good person. This man, who had just supposedly gotten saved, told me yes. I looked around, and the other two men beside me said nothing and did nothing. We went to a few more places and eventually reached a home with a Roman Catholic young lady who came to the door. She said she was a professing Christian. Even though she said that all churches were the same, the soul winner he was with gave her assurance of salvation by quoting 1 John 5.13. And so that's just one example. Um, and so very, very shallow. And uh, it's, it is something that should not be passed over just lightly. Now, the way it gets passed over very lightly is that uh, they just try to get people to acknowledge that they're a sinner. You know what? Most people will acknowledge that they've sinned. But acknowledging that you've sinned is different than acknowledging that you're that bad of a sinner that you need a Savior and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Most people who would say, uh, most people who believe that they're somehow working their way to heaven still would believe that they have sinned. They'll say they've done wrong things. But that, does, that alone does not mean uh, that, uh, that that is a thorough understanding of them being a sinner and there's conviction in their heart of their need for a Savior. 
And number three, to be saved, a person has to acknowledge that they are the sinner that the Bible says they are. Turn to Rome. Uh, let's... We aren't going to read this whole passage. On your, on your sheet there, on your outline, it says Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through Romans 3, 23. Now that whole passage, that portion of Scripture is mentioned there because the whole first part of Romans deals with establishing thoroughly that all have sinned. So even though, unfortunately, there's some who use the Romans road, and there's nothing wrong with using the Romans road uh, uh, outline for witnessing, but you know, if you're actually going to use Romans for, as a pattern for witnessing, you've got to spend a whole lot more time on the issue of sin. Because Paul spent a lot of time on the issue of sin. Let's turn to Romans. We'll read a few verses here. But Romans chapter 1, verse 18, starting in verse 18 there, it says, For the wrath of God, I guess I'll at least read down through the end of this chapter. Romans 1, 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, I have, um, one of the things I notice, a pattern time and time again in Scripture, is uh, in the Psalms we see this, other parts of Scripture we see this, whenever there is something a uh, passage of Scripture that is praising God very often. It's not every time, but very often it comes up as to God being the almighty creator God, a, an emphasis on creation. And you see this even here in Paul establishing uh, the, uh, the, the, the sinful condition of, of humanity is that he's going back to the creation, a reference to creation. And so we see that even in this passage. But it says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like, un, made like to corruptible man and to birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, and, and uh, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And you know that humanity has reached a very bad point in, uh, its, in its degeneracy when people actually have pleasure in their sin uh, and actually are proud of their sin. They're enjoying their sin. You know, there's a lot of people who are living in sin, they commit sin and, and they're miserable and they don't enjoy it, but they're stuck in it. They're, they're just in bondage. But you know, there's more and more where sin is just simply celebrated. It's something to be proud of. It's something to enjoy. And that is, that's, that is the lowest of the low for society when it gets to that point. But that also is, when it gets to that point, that means they're just on the doorstep of judgment too. I mean, it doesn't go much further before God says, all right, that's it. Uh, then chapter 2 and verse 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So that is how Paul starts in establishing the fact that all have sinned. So we, we quote Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We'll commit... 
uh, we'll, uh, we'll quote Romans 6.23 where it says, uh, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So uh, we, we quote those particular verses through Romans 3.10, as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. And those are key verses. But when you pack, take all of that together uh, from Romans 1.18 to Romans 3.23, it is a thorough, thorough discourse, a thorough uh, writing uh, letter of, of uh, how sinful humanity is. And, so we, and for someone to be saved, they do need to acknowledge that they are the sinner that the Bible says they are. And if a person doesn't, does not admit that, they cannot be saved at that point. And uh, for, this, for this to happen, for, for people to acknowledge that they are the sinner that the Bible says they are, uh, the ground of the soul has to be properly plowed, and the divinely ordained plow is the law. And uh, the, that's why the Bible, quoting here from the book, this is why the Bible is two-thirds law before we come to the New Testament with its gospel of grace. The Old Testament is the preparation for the new. And so he dealt, Paul dealt with God's holiness, and he dealt with man's lost condition, and then he got into the gospel of justification by faith. And so if someone wants to use what is the Roman's robe, we've got to spend a longer time on establishing the law and how people have sinned. And uh, once again, it is not just simply trying to get a, an assent, an intellectual assent that I have sinned, that the person has sinned. Just because a person has sinned does not necessarily, or just because a person admits they've sinned does not mean they have a repentant heart. They need to be convicted of just how bad of a sinner they are. I, I think I've said this before, but uh, talking to some people in the parking lot back here uh, a number of months ago, I think it might have even been last summer at this point, but, um, you know, I, I, there were, I had an opportunity to give uh, the gospel to a few people back there, and uh, some of them kind of walked away. They didn't really want to hear it, but then there were a couple other ones I was talking to, and and there was one woman back there who was very interested in it, but when I got to the point where that a person is, is in need of a Savior because they're that bad of a sinner, she, you could just tell she was not grasping that. That was, that was a main, major hindrance. You know, I could have said, well, would you like to have a home in heaven? Would you like to have eternal life? She could have said, oh, yeah, yeah. I could have said, well, pray this prayer then. I mean, have you sinned? Well, sure, I've sinned. But she didn't recognize and did not admit that she was that bad of a sinner who actually needed a Savior. You could, there was a block there, a blockage. And for a lot of people, that blockage is there in a lot of lost people. And, and so it's not a matter of just getting them to acknowledge that they have sinned. It's, it's getting them to, to acknowledge. They need to acknowledge that they are the sinner that the Bible says I am. And I shouldn't say getting them to. It's not a coercion necessarily. It's not a manipulation. It is the Holy Spirit of God convicting their heart based on the use of the law of God. Uh, number four, God's law exposes man's lost condition by revealing God's holiness and justice. And uh, in Genesis, um, think about uh, God's holiness and justice being revealed in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. We see His holiness, we see His justice, how, uh, how He dealt with uh, Adam and Eve. And, uh, and they were responsible to keep God's commands. And they said, He said, of all the trees of the garden you can eat, but uh, this one, this, except this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat of it. In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And uh, so that, I mean, God gave, God gave them a very clear-cut command. They broke that, and that is what introduced sin into the world. And so we need a recognition of God's holiness and justice. That is very much downplayed in, uh, unfortunately, even among churches today, even among professing Christians. And those that do that are doing a great disservice to the lost world by downplaying uh, in, in downplaying God's holiness and justice, and, and they focus almost solely, almost exclusively on the love of God. Well, the love of God is very important, but the love of God that prompted him to, uh, uh, prompted Jesus Christ to come to the earth to die for our sins was to satisfy his justice because of his holiness. That's why Jesus Christ had to die in the first place, because God is a holy God, he's completely just, and so without a perfect sacrifice to take our place, we would have no hope 
uh, in uh, no hope in the Lord anyway to begin with. And so we need to recognize uh, God's holiness and justice. We need to preach God's holiness and justice. Not, not certainly, I'm not advocating anything out of balance. There are people who go from one extreme to another. But I'm saying it's st it has to be a substantial part of our preaching and teaching and witnessing about uh, God and about the gospel of how holy and just God is. And if, if a person, I mean, if, if God isn't a just God, well, then there's no reason we would need to trust in Christ as our Savior anyway. I mean, if, if, if everybody's just um, going to be accepted by God because of his love, and that's really the direction more and more of what people think, that, uh, well, you know, except the, I mean, the worst of the worst murderers and, I mean, the really bad people, there's certainly a place in hell for them, but everybody else is generally good. I mean, that's the mentality of society. And, uh, but we need to, we need to, if when, in light of God's holiness, all of humanity looks pretty dark and dirty. We need, a, we need an accurate comparison, not comparing person to person, but comparing person to God. And everyone is darkened and dirty and sinful in that regard. Uh, number five, God's law exposes... Uh, let's go to Isaiah 6. Excuse me, I didn't uh, have you turn there. Let's uh, turn to Isaiah 6 before we move on to the next point. The last point, Isaiah chapter 6. Important verses. And on this subject... Isaiah 6, verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew uh, one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken, and goes on from there. So who shall, whom shall I send? And he says, Here am I, send me. But he had a recognition when, when his first recognition, when he saw the Lord, high and lifted up, the first things out of his mouth. I said, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. And if a person does not view God in that way, where they, we recognize that woe is us, we are undone in, in comparison to God, then we have a false view of God. A person has a false view of God. If they can, if they can just casually... Talk about God, look at God, and, 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 uh, and not, not come to that conclusion in our, if we were to compare our fleshliness, our humanity, to, to the Lord. Uh, I was, uh, there's a, um, over on Federal Street, the church over there, uh, the, the Episcopal Church, they have a, some sort of sign up, and has a, it's a paragraph of things, and at the very end it says, God is more concerned, uh, paraphrasing here, God is more concerned about the hope of the future, the hope of your future than the sins of your past, or God is more interested in the hope of your future than the sins of the past. And just, just by that statement, and I'm thinking, what about the sins of your future? I mean, <laughs> you're not going to sin in the future. You're, you only have sins in the past. So what they're doing is, they're, give, they're trying to give people assurance without believing or preaching the real source of assurance. Now, I'm, I'm all for assurance. I'm all for, you know what, uh, when a person trusts in Christ as their, as their Savior, they're washed, their sins are washed away, they're, uh, they're, they're cleansed, they're, made, they're, they're declared righteous on the basis of what Jesus Christ did. Uh, I'm all for that. And when a person believes that and a person truly trusts in Christ, they have... You know, I'm all for assurance of salvation. But the problem is they don't preach the gospel over there. And a lot of churches in Greenfield don't preach the gospel. They don't, I, I, asked, I asked someone, um, you know, I said, well, what, what do you, um, you know, how does a person have eternal life or have their sins for good or how is a person saved? And someone told me, he um, says, well, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, <laughs> he says, by following the teachings of Jesus. Well, 
Okay, well, that's not quite it, uh, except for the, you know, the teaching, you know, repent and believe the gospel, but except you repent, you shall likewise perish. You've got to follow that teaching. But, um, you know, there are people who they make themselves or they declare themselves followers of Christ without actually knowing Christ. So they, they have the walk, the idea about a walk with Christ, but yet they've, they've never been justified. And, uh, and, so, and part of the problem is there's a false view of God being taught to people. That basically, you know what, don't worry about the sins of your past. Just focus on God has a great hope for the future. They don't, if, but if they're not preaching the gospel that people have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that they need to trust in Christ alone as their Savior, there is no hope for the future for these people. Though that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say there's no hope for the future at all. There is hope for the future in a believer's life, but they're, they're uh, missing a major component of uh, what the Bible teaches. Um, there's a lot of confusion. I was reading, I was, I was reading a, a portion on, I was, I was getting ready for tonight's message. Uh, it was actually more in relation to that. But I was reading a, a paragraph or a, a writing. It was actually fairly lengthy on the United Methodist Church denomination website. And it had to do with baptism. And I mean, to read down through the whole thing, you come away more confused than you do educated because in a lot of ways they speak out of both sides of their mouth because baptism itself, baptism alone doesn't save you. It needs to be accompanied by a profession of faith later. But, but baptism washes away a child's original sin and they become a member of the church, but not an active member of the church because you know they're not mature enough. And it's all a bunch of it's it's a bunch of gobbledygook. It's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And um, you know, rather than just clearly believing in, you know what, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for sinners. You need to believe on Jesus Christ. Then after that, you believe, partake of uh, you participate in believers' baptism. And you need to, uh, and that doesn't have a part of your salvation. So it's, it's just, it's very complicated, very complex, it's very confusing. And so God's, when we get a picture of who God is, God's holiness and His justice, uh, then we will get, have, should have the right response. But and my whole point in giving those examples is when churches are giving a false view of God, of who God is, it's going to lead people to the wrong response to God. And then number five, let's go on to that. God's law exposes man's sinful condition by showing what God requires. Exodus 20 contains the Ten Commandments. Can anyone perfectly keep the Ten Commandments? Has everyone, anyone ever perfectly kept, kept the Ten Commandments? No. Uh, and that's, that's only a summary of the overarching view of uh, God's law. I mean, he gave the children of Israel uh, hundreds of laws to keep, and it was for the purpose of showing them uh, that they could not keep it. Uh, but he expected, that was, that was his expectation. That was, that was the purpose of the law. Uh, James, I'm going to just read a couple of verses here. Um, we'll, we'll turn to some shortly. But uh, James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So offending in one point of the law, the, the penalty for that is the same as if you'd broken the whole thing. doesn't make a difference if you've broken one law or broken a hundred of God's laws. Now, all of us have broken, you know, multiplied times of, of God's law, but no one's only broken one. But, uh, if, but even if someone could, theoretically, if someone did just break one law, you know, that first time a person breaks God's law, there it's, it's as if they've broken the whole thing. And uh, Revelation 4, uh, let's see, let's go, to, let's go to Matthew instead. Go to Matthew chapter 5, we'll read these verses. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 uh, shows the destination of the sinners, those who are in their, dead in their trespasses and sins which eternally is, for the lake, is the lake of fire. Death and hell cast in the lake of fire. Revelation 20 and verses 14 and 15. 
No, uh, that, that's in Revelation 20. Go to Matthew. I'm getting my numbers mixed up here in my head. Matthew 5. So you don't need to turn to Revelation. But Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22. We'll see how Jesus actually raised the bar in Matthew. He didn't lower the bar. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 21 says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say unto his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And then down in verse 28 it says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So the law said thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said if someone lusts after a woman, he's committing adultery with her in his heart. So you know, what's he pointing out? What's he saying here is the standard is higher actually. Jesus didn't come to lower the standard. He actually raised the standard. And that's why that's an example so much even more of why we need the Lord, why people need to be saved, because even what Jesus taught. And that's why it's, it's very, um, uh, very deceptive when people, when churches will say, a lot of the, the modern churches today, will, they'll say, we're following the teachings of Jesus. But yet they will not preach about sin. But Jesus did. So they're not following the teachings of Jesus because they're only cherry picking the parts of, that they like, the parts that sound really nice and fluffy and, and, and just good, makes everybody feel warm and fuzzy inside. And, uh, but Jesus had some strong teaching about sin, about right and wrong. And so once again, we see what God requires. All right, someone could say, God, well, I've never committed adultery. Well, have you ever looked upon a woman to lust after her? Well, yeah, okay, well, sorry, you're a sinner just like the rest of them. <laughs> Even those that did commit adultery. Did you ever, you know, I've never murdered someone. Yeah, but were you ever uh, angry, bitter, vengeful against someone? Well, yeah, okay, well, sorry, that's sin too. Even if you didn't kill someone. And so Jesus raised the bar in the New Testament, not lowered it. And then Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, in verse 36, Matthew 22 and verse, oh, let's, uh, let's start at verse 34. Matthew 22 and verse 34, it says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, a lot of times when uh, you hear, once again, modern day Christianity, uh, very often when these are quoted, they forget verse 40. It says, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So there are some, well, God just wants us to love God and love each other. What does that mean? Well, it means if you truly do love God and you truly do love others, those other commandments that God gave, they're going to fall into place because you're actually, you have true love for God and others. The other, th the other thing is that this lawyer tempted him, uh, this Pharisee, he was tempting him because the Pharisees, they wanted to know, you know, which outward... You know, which outward part of the law, which, what, what thing can we do to, um, you know, what, what part means the most to God, you know, in, in tempting Christ? Well, you know, how would, how would you choose? It'd be hard to choose, but Jesus hit, uh, he, he covered all of it. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. By the way, he's quoting from the Old Testament. That was commanded to Israel. And then, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So on those two, Commandments. And these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Why? Because if you truly love someone, you're not going to steal from them. If you truly love someone, you're not going to murder them. Uh, if you truly love someone, you're not going to commit adultery or fornication with them or against them. And uh, if you truly love God, you're not going to... Uh, a reflection of our love for God is by doing the other things that he says to do. That's the true reflection of love for God. 
And if someone just really is flippant toward other things, you know, and the, the word I, I just, you know, you hear, I hear it all the time. I hear people just say this, legalism, legalism. The fact that someone wants to keep the Ten Commandments or someone wants to actually keep a, 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 a principle or a precept in God's Word that's, that's basically God's Word says this, so I'm going to follow it. Oh, that's a legalist. Now, that's the, way people, that's the way a lot of Christians act today. And number one, they don't even know the definition of, the, of what a legalist is. You know, Pharisees were legalists, but that's because they were thinking that their outward conformity was going to gain them favor with God. So it has to do with salvation. It doesn't have to do with just living a holy life. If I think just my outward conformity and my outward, uh, uh, you know, my, my keeping the, the, uh, just the outward commandments is going to make God pleased with me, then that is one thing. But you know what? The people who cry legalists the most, aren't they judging people's hearts then? That because I'm doing something on the outside and, you know, might be called a legalist, how do, they know what, how do they know what my motivation is? I'm not doing it to be saved. I'm not doing it to earn my salvation. And so, um, you know, so for those who talk the most about loving God with all their heart and loving others, they need to conclude verse 40 on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So if we could, you know, if you had a, a decoration on the wall, uh, you could have a, um, you know, a plaque or something that says, love God. Then Right along, right along with that, the two main ones, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And then underneath, you could have chains attached with all the other laws of God. On these two, hang all the law and the prophets. It, it's connected. That if to truly love God got to, and truly love others, those other things will be followed as a manifestation of the love for God. And then if we love God and we, we break those other, mor the moral law of God and the, the principles and commandments of God's word, you know, then we'll, if we love God, we'll say, oh, oh God, I'm sorry for doing that. Well, I want to, I want to do what's right. Please help me to do what's right. And uh, that's, that is the reflection of the love for God. It's not a, just a bunch of, oh, we're just all happy and fuzzy and love each other. And uh, we're just all getting along. No, it, it has to do with living life, uh, following what God says in his word. And then let's, let me see what time it is. Um, all right, one more, one more verse. We'll go to Revelation 20. I went, wanted to go to Matthew first, but I think we should go to Revelation 20. And so the Ten Commandments, mentioning the Ten Commandments, you can actually use uh, the Ten Commandments to, uh, as part of witnessing, you know, in, in establishing the law of God, because uh, it, that's, that's the greatest summary of you know, God's moral law. There was a lot of cer there were ceremonial laws, there were uh, Levitical laws, uh, governmental laws uh, that God gave to Israel, but God's moral law doesn't change, and Jesus showed that in, in Matthew, that he was reiterating those things um, and re raising the standard. And so uh, using the Ten Commandments can be uh, is, is effective in, in that of showing what God requires. And then Revelation chapter 20, verse 14 says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I should have read a couple of the previous verses, but it says in verse 11, I saw the, a great white throne and, to, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book, books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And so even those who have already died up to this point, uh, died without Christ, they will be delivered up at that time of the great white throne, uh, they will be delivered up to be judged according to their works, and then the final destination is the lake of fire. And uh, so I would say to those, you know, to those who do believe in uh, just doing good, that they think they're going to be saved by doing good, well, they are right that God is going to judge them according to their works. But the problem is they're all going to come up short. No one who, who believes that their works are going to be are good enough are, are going to find that they're good enough. And they'll find that out at the great white throne judgment. Uh, they'll be judged according to their works. And they'll, they'll be 
And, and they'll find out that when the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, they will find that out at that great white throne. And that's why the law of God is so important uh, that people need to know it's, all, any, any good work that you do is going to come up short when it comes to salvation, when it comes to being justified. Uh, any good work is not uh, going to cut it. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I want to uh, just establish here at the end. Um, let me just read a paragraph here. This establishes the fact that all men are sinners who constantly break God's laws and that all men will be punished with eternal punishment. We can never live up to what God requires and can never pay the price that God's law demands. Further, when the sinner dies without Christ, he continues to sin forever. Thus, the wages of sin is not only physical death, but also eternal death in the lake of fire. The punishment lasts forever because the sinning goes on forever. They never come to the place where they have, um, you know, they had their their opportunity here on earth to repent, but they're, they're without Christ. Uh, and, and the other thing about eternal punishment is how bad is sinning against God? How bad is sinning against God? You know, there, were, there are people, I've, I've heard it said, you know, well, the worst, the, worst kind of, uh, you know, the worst kind of hell is just separation from God. Even Billy Graham said that in one of his books. He said, you know, about he was questioning whether or not hell was actually a place of fire. Because he said, I mean, that's the... The worst kind of hell is just being separated from God. You know what? There are people here on this earth who want nothing to do with God. So if hell is only being separated from God, they'll be just fine with that. That's not a punishment for them. But punishment in the lake of fire, that is a punishment for sinning against a holy God. Um, Bible-believing preachers used to understand the ground of the human heart must be plowed with the law before it can bear the sweet fruit of conversion. Some of the old evangelists would hold meetings and not even preach the gospel for the first few days, preparing the way by preaching hard on God's holiness and sin and judgment. J. Frank Norris once preached an entire week on the subject of hell without giving an invitation. Only after a full week of such preaching did he give an invitation, and more than 150 were saved. In the 1960s, Oliver B. Green preached 25 radio messages in a row on the wrath of God. I doubt he could even get away with that on any of the uh, national Christian radio stations now. It would be considered far too negative. And everything is quick and shallow today. And we've all been affected by the spirit of the times. Now, I don't know. We're having, a, we're having a revival meeting from Sunday through Friday. And I don't know what the preacher is going to preach. I doubt he's going to preach every night on hell. Uh, but at the same time, you know, some might think, wow, a whole week of meetings. Well, you know what? If you're truly going to experience revival in your heart and revival in our church, uh, well, it actually takes more than a week of meetings, more than a week of preaching. And uh, because it, to lay the groundwork, because we get, we, we get so much of influence in the world in our lives, we need some focused time of preaching and, and revival preaching. But, uh, but J. Frank Norris, as he said here, once preached an entire week on the subject of hell without giving invitation. But you know, a lot of modern day preachers, they would preach that first message and they want those decisions. They want, they want people to come forward. They want people to raise their hand without making sure the ground is plowed first. But uh, we need to get back to that, uh, that type of preaching where, you know what, we, we plow the ground, we sow the seed, it gets watered and let the Spirit of God do the work, not be impatient, not be shallow in our gospel presentation. And that is where the God's law comes in is so important uh, that it needs to be a part of our evangelism.